Okay. All right, everybody. Well, I want to thank you for coming to this breakout session. And uh, right now, now we have our next paper, which is called Justification and Life for All, a response to evangelical universalist exegesis of Romans 5, 12 through 21, which will be presented by Allison Quint. She's a PhD student majoring in systematic theology with a minor New Testament here at Fuller Theological Seminary. She also has an MDiv with an emphasis in research from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School and a BA in Bible and Theology from Biola. Yeah. Allison is inter interested in uh, introducing perceived innovative theological ideas and fresh ways to the evangelical world, and she's also <laughs> interested in working with nonprofits. She's contributed to an evangelical tradition, Christians for Biblical Equality, uh, it's a 2013 special edition journal for the Evangelical Theological Society. Not bad. <laughs> and she's recently contributed to Mutuality Magazine's winter 2014 issue on Genesis. Yep. <laughs> All right. So we'll have about 45 minutes to hear her paper, and then we'll have some Q&A for about 10 to 15 minutes or so. So um, with that, take it away. All right. Well, I hope this isn't going to serve to be confusing, but um, I'm going to be going over, uh, I'm going to try to set the stage a little bit before I actually launch, in launch into the heart of the debate. And so, it just because um, Romans 5, 12 through 21, can, the structure can be a little complicated. Um, and so, it's because um, verse 12 starts with um, kind of an introduction, just as, and then ends in so also for verse 18, with this giant digression here. So, it can be hard to kind of keep track of. Um, but I hope you'll open your Bibles to Romans 5. Hope everyone brought Bibles. <laughs> and just try to follow along. And every translation is going to be a little bit different, and that can actually influence um, some of the interpretation as well. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, awesome. All right, I'll just go ahead and start reading. Is life through Jesus Christ for all of humanity or just some? If it is for all, then in what sense is it for all? In other words, has the work of Christ made life possible and available for all, or gone a step further and made it so that all, without exception, will live forever? The position of this paper is that although the typological parallelism between Adam and Christ in Romans 5, 12-21 might appear to the universalist to support universal salvation, a more thorough reading reveals support for universal accessibility to salvation. The position of this paper will be elucidated by first considering the merits of the universalist position, concentrating on the parallel nature between Adam and Christ, and the universal nature of the passage, and providing uh, reasons for thinking this position is ultimately not successful in making the universalist case. Next, a positive case for universal accessibility, you can also think of it in terms of availability, over universal salvation will be explored. Finally, a less considered approach to universal accessibility, which might be conditional immortality, will be introduced in order to provide further plausibility and explanatory power for universal accessibility. Before beginning, I would like to introduce a Christian universalist understanding of salvation and commend those who hold to this perspective, especially Robin Perry, also known as Gregory MacDonald, with whom I will primarily be engaging in this paper. And um, Robin Perry was also kind enough to make some suggestions on the paper, um, so I want to thank him for that. <laughs> this type of universalism believes that those who do not accept Christ in this life will experience hell after death. Further, it is believed that the Bible is both inspired and authoritative and adheres to tenets crucial to the Christian faith, such as Trinity, creation, sin, atonement, the return of Christ, salvation, through Christ alone, by grace alone, and through faith alone. Finally, along with other evangelical Christians, this type of universalist may or may not believe the soul is inherently immortal. We'll talk more about that later. <laughs> Where the universalist differs from other Christians is on a secondary issue, the ultimate fate of all of humanity. Perry explains a universalist position on the ultimate fate of human humanity as follows. She believes that one's eternal destiny is not fixed at death, and consequently that those in hell can re repent and throw themselves upon the mercy of God in Christ and thus be saved. Further, she believes that in the end, everyone will do this. So you can kind of perceive two steps here. Eternal destiny is the issue here, not reality of hell, not the reality of hell. Universalism takes seriously God's professed desire that all human beings be saved, you can kind of see this in, reflected in 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 2 Peter 3, 9, and it encourages this desire in Christians. It's my privilege to, encourage, to engage with and be challenged by this Christian perspective. All right, now this is the less interesting part, but still needed, so you can kind of um, get yourself situated in the text. So understanding the overall 
organization of Romans 5, 12 through 21 is helpful for understanding the flow of the passage and with it the debate, but it's not the heart of the debate. The organization of Romans 5, 12 through 21 can be understood several different ways. The reason for this is because it is difficult to discern precisely what Dia Tau Tu, which is this, this thing up here, refers back to in Paul's letter. Part of the difficulty, according to Stanley Porter, is that the relative pronouns have no particular referent. Thus, to speak generally, a pronoun may, may substitute for a variety of syntactical units from a word to a much larger unit segment. So it can um, actually refer back to a whole chunk of text or just a single word. Um, so it can get kind of complicated in terms of what's Paul building off of from before. This allows for DS Tau 2 to substitute for verses 9 through 11, verses 1 through 11, or further back in Romans. For this reason, it is difficult to be dogmatic concerning the precise referent of Dia Tau 2. Perhaps given its closer proximity, it is, it is preferable to at least go back to verses 1 through 11. Um, Cranfield understands verses 12 through 21 as a conclusion for verses 1 through 11, translating Dia Tau 2 as wherefore. I'll skip um, his quote. Ben Witherington identifies Dia Tau 2 as both retrospective and prospective and translates it as because of this. Romans 5, 12 through 21 functions as both the grounding for the hope of believers he have in verse 1 through 11 and reveals that the work of Adam and Christ have implications that are not only for those who are currently in Christ, but also for the world. Paul's use of the first person plural in verses 1 through 11 is replaced by the third person plural, further indicating this transition. Richard Bell, who argues for universalism in Romans 5, 12 through 21, believes Cranfield's understanding of the connection between verses 12 through 21 with, his, with verses 1 through 11 would be plausible if the latter all on Christ's side from verse 18 down there um, corresponds to the us in verses 1 through 11. That's kind of the transition I was talking about. Of course, he thinks all literally means every single person. Hence, how can the universal effects of Jesus' righteous act be deduced from Romans 5, 1 through 11? or from any earlier section of Romans. Due to prior commitments to a universalist view, which he provides reasons for later, he believes Dia Tau Tu brings in the discussion from, verses, from um, chapter 1, verses 18, through chapter 3, verse 20, where universal condemnation will be overcome. The major point of 5, 12 through 21 becomes less about how sin and death affect mankind, and it's more concerned with the overwhelming power of grace of God seen in Jesus Christ. This last conclusion is not entirely antithetical to Cranfield's view, since Cranfield believes verses 12 through 21 is speaking of the universal effectiveness of the work of Christ. Further, pitting the two ideas against each other may be a false dichotomy, since Paul utilizes the anti-type Adam to indicate how sin, personified in verse 12, and death affect humanity in order to emphasize the power of Christ. So how should the rest of the passage be understood? The following generally, general ordering appears consistent with, but not limited to, a universal interpretation as well. Paul begins, so in other words, I think this can be accepted on both sides, so hopefully that'll be helpful. Paul begins in verse 12 with a um, protasis and digresses for five verses containing three contrasts between Adam and Christ. And this is following closely with the outline now. Since he digressed for such a lengthy period, he summarizes his content in verse eight, uh, 18a. Um, and I, before resuming with the apodosis in verse 18b to develop his original train of thought, so it's just as, so also, but you have to ha deal with everything in between first. Classic Paul. Um, <laughs> finally, in verses 20 through 21, Paul concludes with the triumph of grace. In the end, grace rules over death, as does, according to verse 17, those who receive Christ. Cranfield describes a lengthy digression in verses 13 through 17 as a parenthetical. It is though Paul has begun to launch into his grounding for Christian confidence with the universal implications of the works of Adam and Christ, but then decides to clarify some things first. He elucidates in verses 13 through 14 that sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but one knows sin existed before the law because death existed from Adam until Moses. Even if sin is not recognized as such, it is still in the world because of its consequences death evidences it. Actimer um, explains that, Actmeyer, um, that the universality of human mortality is Paul's empirical proof of the universality of human sin. As long as death remains, therefore, sin continues to exercise power in God's creation. Following evidence for sin's power in verses 15 through 17, Paul focuses on the dissimilarity between Adam and Christ, and that's where some, uh, quite a bit of our discussion will be. Their inequality in power, and Adam is revealed as an antitype. Although the two are similar in that their deeds have universal implications for humanity, 
thus enabling a typological comparison in the sense of Adam prefiguring Christ, it is crucial to understand that Paul is not emphasizing that Adam and Christ are otherwise alike. Doing so may end up reading more into the parallel than is otherwise present. Similarly, it's, inde um, similarly, um, it's indeed present functioning to highlight the superior power of Christ's work, but one must not press similarity beyond what is clearly presented. Paul provides three contrasts to highlight the dissimilarity between Adam and Christ. The first is introduced with Adam's transgression conveying, uh, conveyed as not like um, the grace in verse 15. And then, um, so it's kind of like, it's not like the transgression, so also the grace. So the two are different, is what he's saying. Since the actions of Christ and Adam are being compared, the grace is most likely Christ's obedience as God's gracious act. The contrast has to do with one act bringing death and the other abundance. This is an argument from the lesser to the greater, conveyed by, if by one transgression, much more the grace. Perhaps qualitatively, the grace and free gift is greater than it is. Um, it has the power not only to cancel the effects of Adam's work, but to create positively life and peace. Adam acted on his own accord, but Christ acted on God's accord for the benefit of others. The next dissimilarity is also introduced by not like in verse 16. Here, the difference is spelled out in terms of result. Adam's transgression led to the divine judgment, krima, which resulted in condemnation, um, and that's katakrima, but also the gift from many transgressions to acquittal. I'm going to skip over lots of Greek here. <laughs> if one transgression resulted in condemnation, one would think that multiple transgressions would result in further condemnation. Instead, it results in acquittal. The gift of Christ, who waded, as it were, into the strong, dark current of human sinfulness and, by giving his life for the ungodly, converted condemnation into justification. And that's taken from um, uh, Brendan in Romans. In the final dissimilarity, Paul reasons in verse 17 that if death reigned through Adam, those in Christ who receive the abundance of grace, the gift of righteousness, will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. In Adam, death ruled over those afflicted. In Christ, those affected will rule through Christ. One act brought subjugation and the other freedom in Christ, a contrast further developed in Romans 7 through 8. Christ result, restores the rule of humankind through himself, or at least for those receiving the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Does the phrase, those who receive, significantly limit those who may benefit from the work of Christ? This will be addressed when considering whether Paul has universal salvation or universal accessibility in mind in Romans 5, 18 through 19. Now we're going to get to the good part. <laughs> One second. Before proceeding, it is important to be clear about what is and is not being argued for, as well as the meaning of key terms. First, it will become evident in this paper that neither the universalist or overtly non-universalist reading is presented as obvious within this text. However, one can be certain that this text teaches the universal scope of salvation in the form of universal accessibility or availability. Salvation has been made available to all who will receive it. This specific text does not spell out for us what additionally is entailed, whether all or only some or even none will ultimately receive eternal life. And that's why you need more than exegesis of um, singular passages. So, What are the implications for the universalist if, there, if this is true? It means that one of the key texts often appealed to, Romans 5, does not itself teach universalism, nor are interpretations that take the text to be teaching the opposite of universalism. So in other words, people, it's not, um, I, take, I believe that um, refutations of the universalist interpretation aren't always as successful as they might um, want to be. It is important to note that the universalist position itself involves taking more than one step to arrive at a universal salvation when interpreting the universal nature of Romans 5, 12 through 21, as was mentioned by Perry above, um, so earlier. First, the universalist believes that it is possible for all humanity to be saved and that salvation is universally accessible to all people, in this case, even after death. The point that salvation is available to all is shared by what I am calling an accessibility view. Secondly, the Universalist additionally believes that all will indeed be saved. All will be made righteous and all will reign in life through Jesus Christ. In light of the second point, the question then becomes whether Romans 5, 12 through 21 indicates not only the possibility and ability, the accessibility for all people to live forever, but also the conclusion that all will in fact live forever. This means that in order to successfully argue for universal accessibility over universal salvation, 
only, um, not only is the first step needed to be argued for, um, but in addition needs to show that the second step is either apparent in the text or that the text refutes this notion. I will be arguing the former. The universalist must successfully make a case for the first step, the accessibility or availability of salvation, and then for the final step, universal salvation. This includes showing that more than the universal scope of salvation is in view, which could be either step, but also that specifically the text teaches all people will in fact be saved. Much of the discussion regarding the universal implications of the work of Christ for humanity in Romans 5, 12 through 21 is concentrated in attempts to understand Paul's meaning in Romans 5, 18 through 19, specifically. Those who believe Paul is communicating universal salvation claim the most natural reading of Romans 5, 18 through 19 is that just as all have participated in the sin of Adam, so all have participated in the righteous act of Christ. The many in verse 19 are the all in verse 18. To all appearances, Paul here identifies one all, that is, all human beings, and makes two distinct parallels between statements about that one all, with the second implying all human beings shall receive justification in life and hence shall eventually be reconciled to God. The universalist perspective comes down to the following. One, understanding all to include every person, and two, the similarity of the Adam and Christ parallel to be indicating all will in fact be saved. Douglas Moo volunteers that the universalist thinking is naturally very appealing, who likes the idea that many people will be consigned to the eternal punishment of hell. However, as will become evident, the universalist stance has more going for it than mere well wishes. The strength of the universalist interpretation of verses 18 through 19 is that it immediately picks up the universal implications of the work of Adam and Christ and is in line with the Creator's desire that all people live in relationship with Him. However, it is difficult to see how the parallel nature of Romans 5, 12 through 21, and specifically 18 through 19, on their own, would lead to a universalist interpretation. The reason, they, um, the reason why some might perceive universalism as obviously evident, evident in the passage is the typological similarity between Adam and Christ in relation to the universal effects of their deeds. Crucial to this part of the discussion is the understanding that when typology, especially antitypes, are, are being used, one must locate the, dissimil uh, the dissimilarities, as was mentioned previously, as well as the precise similarity found in the text, and not go beyond them. Indeed, there is similarity between Adam and Christ. The similarity Paul began in verse eight, 12 was resumed in verse 18. And it has to do with the effects of the works of Adam and Christ reaching all of humanity, but no more. Although Paul dis um, Paul's description is specific, it's not expansive. This similarity additionally pertains to the universalist claim that essentially in verses 18 through 19, all means all, that is, every single human being. If all human beings suffered death under Adam, given the parallel nature, it is expected that all human beings, without exception, would be granted life in Christ if no other limiting or spe specifying factor can be located in the text. A universalist connection is not difficult to perceive in most translations. Um, for verse 18, the NASB reads, So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. It would appear that just as every person gained condemnation, every person will gain justification and perhaps with it life. The burden of proof is then placed on those who wish to limit the all in some way, since all generally means just that all without qualification. So you need something in the text itself to limit it, otherwise you can't just say it's somehow limited. Accordingly, any qualification must be taken from the context and not merely assumed. Okay. There are a few ways one can understand those who gain eternal life to be limited in Romans 5, 18 through 19. One can understand the all within the context of Paul's ongoing discussion of Gentiles and the Gentile inclusion. By all, Paul means that, generally speaking, both Jews and Gentiles have access to life in Christ, just as they both receive death in Adam. Or, one can take the many, in verse 19, as communicating limitation, meaning only the many will be made righteous. Another option is to consider, consider those who receive the abundance of grace from verse 17 as limiting the universal scope of salvation. All of these attempts at limitation try to either limit the universal scope of the salvific work of Christ, or claim the content within the text indicates that a universalist reading is counter to the message of Romans 5. The following are the attempts to claim that all does not include every single individual. The first option that Paul has both Jews and Gentiles generally in mind, instead of every single human on the planet, is an attractive one because it is contextually strong. Throughout Romans, Paul continually has the two groups in mind. Paul begins his letter noting Gentile inclusion in the people of God, um, so chapter 1, 6, 
um, saying the gospel is for Jew and Gentile alike, 1, 16 through 17. And he right asserts Jewish part um, particularism in Paul's chief enemy and the one way of salvation, one of his main emphases. In this line of thought, Wright goes, on, goes so far as to claim, if we were to maintain on the basis of the word all in Romans 5 and 11, that Paul was a universalist, we would do so in the teeth of Romans 2, 6 through 16, 14, 11 through 12, and such other passages as um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 19. The overall idea for Paul is that God will judge as well as give glory, honor, and peace to both Jews and Gentiles alike. Robin Perry concedes the claim that by all Paul means Jews and Gentiles alike, and that it has considerable plausibility. And the concern even lurks in the background of 5, 12 through 21. However, the key inference Paul, um, Perry does not accept is that this excludes Paul's having every particular Jew and Gentile in mind here. In other words, this view is correct in what it affirms and incorrect in what it denies. Perry goes, on, goes a step further to show that the plausibility that Paul does have every single person in mind, not only Jew and Gentile generally. Romans 3, 23 to 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Further, Romans 5, 9b through 12 states, We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Perry masterfully connects this with his overall refutation. The point Paul wishes to establish is that both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. He does this by arguing that all are sinners, and by this he clearly means all individuals. The logic of his argument is that if all individuals are sinners, then of course both Jews and Gentiles are sinners. I think it's, that's very strong. It's a solid refutation. Uh, he confirms that yes, Paul has both Jews and Gentiles in mind generally throughout his letter to the Romans, but that this includes individuals, not just groups. When Paul says all, he may very well have every individual in mind when he considers that both Jews and Gentiles die in Adam, but have life in Christ. The implication for, the implication for this study is that it is possible Paul has only Jews and Gentiles in mind, but it is more plausible, though not conclusive, to think that this includes every Jew and every Gentile. The universal scope of the salvific work of Christ is still intact. And so I think it's possible to still say he has only generally Jews and Gentiles in mind, but it's um, not the best option contextually. Um, and so I think I would like it if a lot more people um, looked at what Perry said and took this seriously, because this is a very um, solid case to me. The next possible refutation against a universalist interpretation of the parallel verses 18 through 19 has to do with the many, hoi polloi, in verses 19 limiting the idea that all gain justification of life as, ex as expressed in verse 18. The many are fewer than all. Perhaps Paul means to say in verse 18 that salvation is accessible to all, but given the ambiguity that comes with le leaving out verbs in verse 18. Yeah, so there's no verbs in verse 18, surprise. <laughs> Um, he clarifies this thought in verse 19, saying it is only the many who will ultimately be declared righteous. All and many are not the same conceptually, and many could be functioning to, ex <clears throat> to express the limited nature of either the scope of salvation or the number of people who will actually be saved. Perry combats this refutation by suggesting the many is a common Hebra uh, Hebraic way of saying all. And more significantly, the many, hoi polloi, is also used in verse 15, referring to the many who died in Adam, and that subsequently grace abounded to the many. The use of it uh, is clearly universal in verse 18, and so it makes no sense to think it functions as a qualifier so soon in the same passage in verse 19. One would need a compelling reason not to take the use of the many as in a uniform way. The last typical way all is considered limited in scope is to accept that those who receive as setting a clear limit on the universal implications of the passage. The idea conveyed is similar to the Adam and Christ parallel find in, found in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it is those in Christ who will be made alive. So there's a, so Paul's very specific in, well, not very specific, but more specific also in um, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. These passages are taken to mean that all is not unqualified, but limited to believers. Receiving salvation by faith is already a concept of Romans, and in Romans 8, 12-13, the issue is framed in terms of consequences of life and death. 
So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. However, part of this refutation is resolved by the universalist simply coming back with the idea that perhaps Paul believes one day everyone will become a believer. Those who receive and in, are in Christ are indeed specific, but they do not overtly indicate whether every person or only some will receive salvation. Paul having the future in mind when it comes to those who receive is the stance of A. Um, Holtgren. For him, the universal statements describe justification for humanity taking place in the future, revealed at the final judgment. What one does in this life does not ultimately affect one's eternal destiny, since everyone will become one that receives life in Christ. This interpretation of the individual text is possible in isolation, but perhaps not the most plausible, given Paul does not seem to believe all will be saved um, elsewhere in his letter. More on that later. However, be that as it may, this um, does mean that the, his, this final critique of the universalist tendency to understand all as pertaining to every individual is not a defeater of the universalist view. The implication for this study is that either the universalist or accessibility views are possible readings. Attempts to limit the scope of the salvific work of Christ are not necessarily the most plausible. Additionally, attempts to defeat the universalist interpretation of Romans 5 are also unsuccessful thus far. Take another sip, doing a marathon here. <laughs> All right. So now we'll go into the Adam and Christ parallel. Although receive may not function to limit the universal scope of the passage, it may be used to offer a case for accessibility and not universalism. A further point in favor of accessibility is that the idea of receiving salvation already adds something to the parallel between Adam and Christ. Casting further doubt on the idea that the typological similarity concerning life and death is as clearly cut in, in the universalist favor and maybe overtly communicating access to salvation. And remember, the universalist um, case, according to Perry at least, is the two step. You have accessibility or availability of salvation, and then everyone actually will um, be granted or access salvation. In other words, there is not a one to one correspondence in the universal effects of the works of Adam and Christ, since there is not an additional step akin to receiving by faith needed to access death through Adam. It is simply an automatic consequence for all of humanity. In a typological relationship, the key is to identify what the similarity is and not to read too far beyond it. The similarity in the Adam and Christ parallel has to do with the universal effects of each one's action rather than the kind of effects. In other words, the effect of Adam's action reaches all people and the effect of Christ's action reaches all people. The kind of effects are already different in that one is life and one is death. Additionally, while Adam's death appears to be automatically applied, one must apparently receive grace and with it life and reign through Christ. Paul does not explicitly spell out how many will receive or if everyone receives in this passage. Additionally, Paul does not spell out whether the work of Christ is immediately effectual for all, whether it merely leads to the salvation of all or some. Yes, the Adam and Christ parallel indicates that the salvific scope is universal, it is available or accessible to all individual people, whether Jews or Gentiles. This component of universalism and other views appears evident. Um, specificity beyond this point has not yet been overly given. It is sometimes claimed that receive has a passive sense rather than an active one, with the implication that perhaps salvation is some something automatically applied to everyone without any active part on individuals to accept the free gift or reject it. The key word here is sense. The participle um, bonitas, is, that's the um, receive word, is present active and nothing grammatically requires that its sense is passive or guarantees that if it is passive that it, necess um, that it necessarily leads to universalism. I. Howard Marshall not only provides instances where lumbano um, is used in conjunction with faith, um, for example in Galatians 3, 2 and 14, but implies a decision from the one receiving, and that's in um, Philippians 2, 7. Again, there is no absolute evidence necessitating or preferring a universalist reading. Reasons why universalism is not the most straightforward option. A closer examination of the evidence so far indicates that the universalist successfully overturns arguments against the universal scope of the effects of Adam and Christ. But its decision concerning whether all will automatically receive salvation versus all will have access to it, is requ it requires that a further step is taken from universal scope to specifying in what way the effect of Christ is universal. All of this is to say that the universalist's strongest point can just as easily be appropriated by views adhering only to the universal accessibility portion. Paul's language may be universal with terms such as anthropos and ponta, 
being used along with Adam himself as a literary device. This point on its own does not guarantee a universal salvation view since it can just as easily uh, support universal accessibility. That is, salvation is open to all. Nowhere does Paul explicitly state the universalist position, and even if the universalist could show he or she had a possible reading for Romans 5, he or she must venture beyond universal possibility and accessibility to all, to all actually living forever. This is especially the case with passages seeming to point in the opposite direction. They must show that their position is the more likely option. So while it, even if you could show that maybe Romans 5 could indicate universal salvation, could, um, and could perhaps indicate other views, you'd have to go into showing it's a more likely option. Part of the problem for automatically assuming universalism or taking it to be the more straightforward option is that verbs must be supplied to verse 18, where they do not exist in the Greek. <coughs> a translation like the following could be taken as a statement of universalism. So then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. Is Paul saying more than the effects of Adam and Christ are universal, but that it, its actual result, it actually results in a universal justification? Is he saying that the result is that all people will live forever? A more wooden translation does not add words like results, and without adding verbs to the text allows for other possibilities and does not make a universal salvation reading necessary. Let me. Therefore, as through one transgression unto all people, unto condemnation, even so through one act, of, and then act of righteousness unto all people acquittal of life. So it's a little bit more wooden and ambiguous um, the way Paul has it. Um, let me quickly, yeah, it's um, ace that he uses a ton of. Is the universalist reading a possible one in isolation of the verbs it supplies? Again, it is not absolutely impossible, but there is no overriding reason to suppose it either. Perhaps the idea is the same as what has been said all along. All people are given an acquittal, uh, acquitted leading, or acquittal leading to life, and so no one needs to die if they receive this grace. Or perhaps everyone actually has been pardoned of their sin and must take the initiative to not receive life. The text doesn't say either way, and other readings are also possible. A um, ton of other readings. Another reason not to simply take the universalist reading as only straightforward reading is a systematic rather than exegetical reason. One could argue elsewhere, Paul seems to believe not everyone will be saved. And I put down a ton of verses, but we don't need to do any proof texting for this paper. Unlike Robin Perry, who understands these other passages in the context of ones he thinks indicate universalism, this point is conceded by Richard Bell. So um, from what I understand, Robin Perry um, just looks at these other passages and puts them through the lens of Romans 5 and a couple of other key passages. That's how he handles it. Um, Richard Bell takes a different route. Um, Paul believes that faith is necessary for his salvation, but does not believe all will come to faith. Romans 11, 25, and possibly verse 23. How does Bell handle what happens to be a contradiction? Likening his perspective to Rudolf Bultmann, he believes Paul takes a historical perspective in one case and a mythical in the other, the mythical one being in Romans 5. However, unlike Bultmann, um, Bell believes such a universal salvation was Paul's real view in Romans 5, 18 through 19. So maybe um, Paul really thought universalism's taught, and maybe slip of the tongue, or um, maybe he's embellishing in some other passages. It might be simpler contra Bell to assume the author Paul is not contradicting himself in the, la in the same letter if it can be helped, and especially if there's no overriding reason to think universalism is taught in Romans 5. If it is somehow true that Romans 5 does, on, the, on a surface level, appear to support universalism, and this is indeed contrary to what Paul clearly expresses everywhere um, one would still not need to propose internal conflict. So Philip Payne um, recognizes the following. Even if one were to take the many as meaning all, this would not necessarily imply that, in fact, all without exception will become righteous. It's common throughout scripture for statements to be made in universal language that are clearly conditioned elsewhere. Think of Mark and Luke's unqualified saying about divorce. Yet Matthew 5 and 19 have accept clauses, and 1 Corinthians 7 says that the believing spouse is not bound if the unbeliever departs. In other words, there are other places where New Testament writers are absol use absolute language when something is actually qualified or conditional elsewhere. Perhaps this is more of a rhetorical move or a matter of emphasis. If one believes Paul indicates elsewhere that not all come to faith and so gain eternal life, 
then Paul's reasoning is also an alternative to consider if one is thrown off by what they perceive as absolute language in Romans 5. And so now I'm going to introduce um, conditional immortality, which you mostly already know about. But I'm going to try, I'm, so I'm not arguing for universal, or sorry, for conditional immortality here. I'm going to use it to help understand an accessibility view and provide a different framework. Universal accessibility is consistent with several theological models. However, a less considered approach to universal accessibility is from the perspective of conditional immortality. To be clear, I will not be arguing for conditional immortality per se, but merely introducing it, offering a conditionalist perspective as a potential help in understanding universal accessibility argued for previously, and possibly furthering the case for accessibility, conditioned, of course, on conditionalism being true. As was mentioned at the beginning of this paper, the key premise shared by, by many, but not overtly all, universalists and evangelical Christians today is the belief in the inherent immortality of the soul. Under this paradigm, the question <clears throat> is not so much about who will live eternally, eternally but what, where each individual will spend eternal life. Either some will suffer in hell for all eternity, or some will suffer for a time and eventually receive the life accomplished by Jesus on the cross. Conditionalism does not share this premise though not all conditionalists are annihilationists or would even speculate on the ultimate fate of those who do not receive Christ. I have in mind um, some of the very early church fathers and some Eastern Orthodox um, theologians. Conditionalism is a belief that God created humanity only potentially immortal. Immortality is a state gained by grace through faith when the believer receives eternal life and becomes a partaker of the divine nature, immortality being inherent in God alone. And that's um, when I'm for the conditionalist, eternal life and the participation in God's immortality involves more than merely being sustained indefinitely. Under a universalist or eternal conscious torment understanding of punishment, one could posit an indefinite sustainment for the purpose of eventually coming to faith or simply as a punishment, making the belief in inherent mortality of a person redundant. However, a conditionalist model has a different understanding of what eternal life is. According to Wolfhart Pannenberg, one must consider that a person is by nature subject to entropy, even if they are destined as a human being for eternal life. Um, Athanasius also has this understanding of um, you're once made of mortal, but also destined for more. And so one can naturally um, decline, but one doesn't have to. In other words, God's intention is that one does not ultimately succumb to entropy and death in the final judgment if they participate in God's immortality. The idea is that, is that God purifies one's earthly life so that mortality is either transformed into immortality or, in Pannenberg's theology, annihilated. This is because an indefinite, continued creaturely existence is actually part of eternal life and is not separated from it so that one can live on indefinitely until finally receiving eternal life. This is Pannenberg's quote, The bringing forth of the creature reaches fulfillment in the creature's continued independent existence, which is the goal of God's creative act. But continued creaturely existence is possible only by participation in God, for God alone has unrestricted duration. All limited duration derives from him. Conditional immortality as a theological position is not merely the belief that the soul is not inherently immortal and that eternal life is gained at some point. Eternal life itself is actually tied to one's ability to continue existing as well as the necessity or the necessary transformation of nature. Panabur's understanding of the process of the glorification or destruction of an individual helps to make this distinction more clear. For him, the mortal cannot, without change, acquire a share in immortality. The idea of changing of this earthly life carries with it a link to judgment. More significantly, the divine glory is the fire of purifying judgment that we find in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15. This was similar to what Perry was indicating earlier, um, but he has a slightly different take on it. One in the same divine light of glory brings believers liberation from the scum of sin and death, even as the wicked have to fear it as a consuming fire. The glory of God functions for Pannenberg as a purifying fire that transforms some individuals so that they share in immortality while others' fire becomes a consuming one. He connects um, all life as to the life-giving spirit. And so even for um, Pannenberg, um, judgment is tied to a uh, desire for life. Um, just not all will necessarily um, decide to receive it. This distinction is helpful because it better highlights the nature of eternal life as a transformation that enables one to enter into continued existence in participation with God. Continued existence is not simply something that occurs until one decides to participate in God's life leading to a better life, or a better eternal life. Additionally, for those who approach conditional immortality from the perspective of participation, it is key to know that participation itself is not the condition for immortality. The condition has to do with how one participates in God's life or has a relationship with Him, not merely that they must have a, such a relationship. 
Some examples of a condition could be by grace through faith, or acknowledging Jesus for who he is, worshiping God as God, etc. Depends on the conditionalist. If one approaches Romans 5 from a conditionalist framework with its own biblical reasons for acceptance, eternal life, i.e. continued existence for human beings, is always inherently qualified, and thus universal salvation is not a guaranteed reading of Romans 5, 12-21, even for those who claim the soul is not inherently immortal. This is because for a universalist and an indefinite continued life is given to all without condition. Rather than gaining eternal life in the conditionalist sense, one has a provisional indefinite life and then gains life in relationship with God. This latter part perhaps being a condition that everyone meets, if they decide to somewhat conform to conditionalism. In sum, when a conditionalist says eternal life, they mean something like an indefinite continued existence in relationship with God enabled by transformed nature. The universalist who accepts the mortality of the soul and the idea that all will meet this condition for life with God separates an indefinite continued existence from life with God. And how am I doing on time? Uh, well, we're about 45 minutes in, so... Uh, okay, so I've, I've, I'm good. Good. Yeah. Okay. One way to understand conditionalism is in keeping with Romans 5 typology is to use Adam's relation to the tree of life in Genesis as an analogy. Adam has to continually partake of the tree of life to live. When he partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil contra God's command, he demonstrated a desire to be like God while acting apart from God. The result was that he was barred from partaking of the tree of life, and so instead of living forever, one day he would die. God, the source of life, required Adam to have a worshipful connection to him and live. Tragically, he chose to become like God, knowing good and evil, apart from God, and became subject to a return to dust. Life only comes through the Creator, and so it is only possible for one to gain life in restored relationship with the Creator. In the case of Romans, it would be through Christ, the Incarnation, who is the perfect bridge between healing the rift between God and man. In the words of Athanasius, Who saved the word of God himself, who also in the beginning had made all things out of nothing? His part it was, was his alone, both to bring again the corruptible to incorruption and maintain his consistency of character with it all. For he alone, being word of the Father and above all, was in consequence both able to recreate all and worthy to suffer on behalf of all and to be an ambassador for all with the Father. For this purpose then, the incorporeal and incorruptible and immaterial word of God entered in our world. Understanding how a conditionalist might see the relationship between sin and death has its occasion in verse 12 of our passage. For views that hold immortality, be, uh, immortality to be inherent in human nature, physical death and spiritual death can be different things with death and even life at times functioning metaphorically. Curiously, Mu wonders if, uh, this is Douglas Mu, if Paul does not only have physical death in view for Romans 5, but spiritual as well. Physical death appears to be in view since this is clearly the case in verse 14. But the passage goes on to contrast death with eternal life. Moreover, in verses uh, 16 and 18, Paul uses condemnation in the same way that he uses death here. Spiritual death for Mu is the estrangement from God that is a result of sin and that, if not healed through Christ, will lead to eternal death. Next, Mu considers the possibility that one should not be forced to choose between the options. Since Paul frequently uses death and related words to designate a physical spiritual entity, total death, the penalty incurred for sin. For the conditionalist, a separation between physical death and separation from God, aka spiritual death, does not need to exist. There does not need to be a physical and spiritual death because physical death and separation from God are inherently connected, just as life is inherently connected with a transformed and restored relationship with God. Mortality is the natural consequence of a life that is apart from God. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6.23 And then the death that resulted from Adam's disobedience was not magical. Rather, an a rather, Adam's death was a natural outworking of being separated from the tree of life after he disobeyed, and subsequently his descendants. This idea is expressed in Genesis 2.17, Dying you shall die. On the day that Adam and Eve disobeyed, the dying process would begin. From a state in which it was possible for them to not die, conditional immortality, they, um, not to die, they passed into a state in which it was poss impossible for them to not to die. So unconditional immortality. <laughs> Nowhere in Romans 5, 12 through 21 is there any indication that death is non-physical. It is a physical reality brought on by sin. And so now universal accessibility through the lens of conditionalism. Having explained what conditionalism is and how a conditionalist might understand Adam in relation to God, life and death, it's time to propose some ways in which a conditionalist view could be helpful for understanding universal accessibility and possibly furthering it. With universalism, it is easy to make a connection between universal accessibility and universal salvation. 
The work of Christ makes the salvation accessible to all, but in such a way that it either eventually leads to everyone without exception accepting a relationship with God, or effectually um, gives everyone, uh, everyone eternal life immediately, so that it is only a matter of time before they enter into a relationship with God. So there's different possibilities within universalism. The difference between both of these types of universalism and conditionalism is that the rhetoric of eternal life. For the universalist, one can have eternal life automatically and enter in relationship with God later or have an indefinite continued life until one enters into relationship with God, and this relationship is called eternal life. Conditionalism denies the premise that humankind is inherently immortal or has an ending life in any sense before gaining eternal life in God, thereby avoiding the potential difficulty of having to explain how one can be given life automatically and yet still need to partake or receive of it since this latter step is already subsumed under the term eternal life for the conditionalist. Since for the conditionalist, God alone is inherently immortal, and humanity's immortality derived by a transformed relationship with Christ, it is possible to conceive of a life being given to all humanity without all humanity actually partaking of it through faith in Christ. Um, that's the condition. Thus, eternal life is made available or accessible to all, with all without all coming to faith. This is where participation language, I believe, is helpful. The sense, of, the sense is not so much of a gift being handed from one person to the other, um, but of a tree of life set in a garden. It is available to all, though one does not necessarily have to partake of it and live. In the same way, the gift of life has been rene renewed by the work of Jesus Christ. This way of thinking sees the gift of eternal life as um, proleptic. Life is achieved for all and given to humanity, and it will become realized at the resurrection when one is transformed from mortal to immortal, partaking in God's unending life. As, one, as was stated earlier, Adam's access to the tree of life was conditional on his relationship with God. It was not something he automatically enjoyed, but something he could receive. When he disobeyed, he was, not long, he was no longer able to partake of its fruit, naturally resulting in his subjugation to entropy and death. The incarnation repairs the rift between God and humanity that resulted from Adam's disobedience and restores the gift of life for all men, but they must receive or partake of it. Under this view, eternal life can actually be more than merely offered to all human beings. It can be given to them. And so you can still have that absolute language in Romans 5, is what I'm saying. Another way of stating it is that salvation has been won or accomplished for humanity. The nuance is slight but significant. One puts the emphasis on what Christ has done, brought life for humanity. While the idea of God offering salvation conveys a process not specified in Romans 5, 12-21. The first is an emphasis found in Romans 5, and the latter is not. This is not to say both senses are not present in Scripture, but it is to say the latter emphasis is not present in 5, 12 through 21. It's possible to think in terms of grace actually being given to everyone, even if not everyone will receive of it. Within this framework, the nature of reception is understood in terms of partaking of what has already been given. When understanding the nature of reception in terms of partaking of what has already been given in the context of conditionalism, it is easier to make sense of accessibility in verses surrounding uh, verse 17, apart from universalism. Nowhere does Paul say one will actually reign in life, except in verse 17, where it is connected to those who receive. Whether or not everyone will actually live forever is ultimately the difference between universalism and conditionalist accessibility model. In verse 15, it is said, For if by the one transgression the many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of the one person Jesus Christ abound to the many. Does grace abounding to the many automatically mean everyone will live forever? If all is the sense of the many here also, one can easily understand this verse to mean that grace has indeed been poured out on everyone, though individuals can decide not to partake of it. In verse 16, Paul says, And the gift is not like through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment from unto condemnation, but on the other hand, the gift from, from many transgressions to acquittal. Again, there is no affirmation that all will live forever. The judgment, crema, is best thought of as a judicial verdict, and it is contrasted with acquittal or making right. The idea of decree, especially with reference to the commandments of God, is the most common in the um, Septuagint and New Testament. And some examples are Luke 1, 6, Romans 1, uh, 32, 2, 26, 8, 4, Hebrews 9, 1, and 10. This means verse 16 can easily be understood as many transgressions leading to acquittal on God's part. That is, through Christ's act of obedience, humanity is actually made right with God. The rift between God and human, humankind has been sealed in the incarnation. They are pardoned of their wrongdoing. This means that no one has to die since the tree of life, in this case the incarnation, has been restored and all can once again eat of its fruit.
How about verses 18 through 19? Do they state that everyone will, reign, will actually reign in life? Early in this paper, it was shown that in verse 18, the verbs necessary to prefer a universalist view are absent. It must be clarified by verse 19, which I have already agreed conveys the sense of all, and also supplies the verbs for the parallel. Still, in verse 19, translation can make all the difference. Is God saying just as through one man's disobedience many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous? Or is Paul saying even so through the obedience of the one the many will be declared righteous? Okay, this one's long. <laughs> Um, note, katastathesoni is a forensic term, often meaning to appoint. The resulting difference is subtle, yet significant. The first translation makes it sound like the many, possibly all, are guaranteed to be made righteous. The other allows for the possibility that by divine uh, so it allows for the possibility by the divine declaration. In other words, unlike the universalist claim that all will be made righteous being apparent in the text, Instead, what is revealed is the accessibility to the state, which opens up the possibility that all can be saved, but not guaranteed. This goes back to the similarity of Paul's parallel between Adam and Christ being in the results of each act and not necessarily the state. If God has poured out grace out on everyone, acquitted everyone, and declared everyone righteous, does this guarantee a universalist view? It does not. And um, there's differences in interpretation um, on that alone. That as well. Um, as was stated before, inherently under a conditionalist view, one would have to receive the gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, and receiving is also part of what those who gain the abundance of grace and righteousness and will, have reign, in, and will reign in life do in verse 17. Perhaps what Paul means by the idea that everyone is, given is that everyone is given grace, acquitted and declared righteous, my summary, is that salvation is not far from anyone. In a sense, it has been given to every person, available in the truest sense. Romans 5 teaches that not only have believers been made righteous through the faithfulness combined with our faith, verse 1, have access by faith unto the, this grace in which we stand through him, verse 2, and had Christ die for them while they were ungodly, verses 6 through 8, but in verse 10, were reconciled while still enemies of God by the death of Christ. Maybe this is the piece missing when considering Romans 5, 12 through 21 in terms of universal accessibility rather than universal salvation. Rather than conveying an offer for salvation, the passage is universal in the sense that salvation has been truly given. This is not unlike 1 John 2, 2, which says that Jesus is the propiti uh, propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Speaking to believers, John claims Jesus has actually satisfied or atoned for the sins of the whole world. This means nothing should keep anyone from salvation, short of not partaking in a relationship with the Creator through Jesus Christ, and so partake of life. It is accessible in the ultimate sense. The rift between God and man has been sealed by Christ's obedience to death on the cross. The sentence has been won, and eternal life made available. All that is needed is for one to receive. Throughout this paper, it has been shown that Romans 5, 12-21 is universal in scope when it comes to the effects of both Adam and Christ. Saving work of Christ was not merely meant for some, but for all. It is in this way that Jesus functions as the fountainhead of a renewed humanity for this passage. Salvation is truly accessible to all people, made possible by the blood of Christ. At the same time, one must partake of life in Christ by faith. Although this makes universal salvation in a sense possible, it does not guarantee it. Although on the surface it might appear Romans 5, 12 through 21 offers support for universal salvation, it was seen that it merely supports accessibility to the salvation. This was accomplished by looking carefully at the merits of a universalist position, especially con concentrating on the parallel nature between Adam and Christ, the universal nature of the passage, and ultimately providing reasons for thinking the universalist position is ultimately unsuccessful. Lastly, a less considered approach to universal accessibility was introduced in order to provide further plausibility, um, conditioned upon the, view, the view's truth and explanatory power. Conditionalism helped to reveal that the line between universal accessibility and universal salvation may be more defined because be, being given life instead of automatically guaranteeing eternal life can inherently involve the, necess the necessity of partaking of it, just as Adam needed to partake of the tree of life in the garden in continued relationship with God. All right. <laughs> so, any questions for clarification first? Yeah, so, critiques later. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, are you basically... Your position, are you a, uh, believe in uh, decisional uh, regeneration? Yeah, um, yeah, so I would be more Arminian, uh, Molinist. Um, 
my position might be a little bit more nuanced, nuanced than that because um, I think our understanding as human beings is very limited. And especially with um, new realizations on the nature of time space and quantum theory, like it's just what the heck do we know? So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm not discussing, so this is between an accessibility view and universalism. So um, it's not so much um, bringing Calvinism into discussion because that would turn into a dissertation. Just in yeah. connection with that, so uh, you're an Arminian, so you, are you a Somewhat. traditionalist or an uh, a Oh, I'm a conditionalist. You're a conditionalist. Yeah. And I'm, I'd say I'm more so Arminian. <laughs> Not a perfect match, but yeah. <laughs> All right, so it looks like, oh, I don't have one quick question. Hmm? Uh, yeah. Thank you. You've covered so many nuances of that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate the interaction with Bell and with Hulkrin. Oh, cool. Um, and I felt like I followed your judgments immensely. Oh, good. Most <laughs> of it. But your conclusions, hmm. that, uh, it was very, at okay. one point I thought you concluded all, that yeah. people, it's necessary to think that all people will be made righteous, must be without exception, is not true. Well, of course, that's obviously okay. true. Some people don't think that. Yeah. Um, but, um, mm -hmm. I don't so see how Paul grammatically could have made that statement in the, on your more likely okay. test, the most likely meaning test, it seems to me. He said that about us. And then I heard you... Wait, can you clarify, clarify that part first? So sure. we don't, yeah. Clarify that part first, what you mean exactly. So what's the confusion? Do you think I'm like claiming two different things? I'm or thinking the likely okay. meaning, the most likely meaning. Sure, it's not okay. necessary to think that, but your test wasn't. <laughs> nobody can... In, People can interpret passages in the Bible all sorts of ways. Yeah, but some are more credible than others, perhaps. Yes, yes. So I'd so like to give leeway where there's leeway. To me, the most yeah. likely thing Paul meant was all yeah. people without exception will be made righteous. Um, declared righteous. It doesn't say well, being made righteous. Well, that's what you mean. At the yeah. end, you, can't, you, you didn't say there's exceptions. You said the, the answer right. okay, is so, that yeah, there's a between declared and made. Yeah, there's a very um, fine nuance there. Right. So the text never actually says, for instance, um, all will um, receive. It doesn't say one. That's what's ambiguous. It doesn't say one way or another. Yeah. And that's why we don't stay in this one passage. So your case yeah. hangs on Mu and Fi and most translations committees translating that in a disastrous way. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> So an, as, an aspect of the accessibility view. So I would say the first part of my paper is the bulk of what the hard evidence is. And the section going into conditionalism is a possible helpful way of looking at it. Um, so that's a possible accessibility view. So if you don't agree with that one, you know, that's fine. Um, no hurt feelings here. I'm in process as well. But the bulk is um, the first part. But if the translation made righteous were honored, then... Declared righteous, yeah. I use, that's, that's the I yeah, sense I take. That, but that's not the way most translations. Um, yeah, well, the thing is, there's no, are you talking about verse, so verse 18, there's no actual talking verb there. Verse 19. Okay, verse 19. We got my Greek here. And the 19. Take a look. So it's for as, um, I'll read a different translation. For as, as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made re sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Okay. Yeah. That's you know, Mu and Fi are the ones who rounded 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 yeah. that conclusion. Yeah. So it, there's a difference there because again, I don't think it's as specific as I would like it personally, and I don't think it's definitely as specific as the universalist would like it. But where we where we I, I can agree with all your judgments yeah. until you get okay. there. Okay. Because we're running over time. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. That's fine. Well, we can talk after too and tease it out. Yep. Thank you.